Dr. Andre Chersik. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your kind words and, and in particular on behalf of the, of the Mayo Clinic and the Center for Regenerative Medicine for the partnership that we have had in recent years as this field uh, is, is rapidly evolving. And so I have a pleasure here on behalf of many Mayo Clinic colleagues that are in the room and then back home to, to many parts of the Mayo Clinic to summarize for you where we stand in terms of the regenerative medicine perspective. And we speak of a blueprint and then ultimately a build out. But the starting point for us as it is for, for many of you is essentially the why of regenerative medicine. And it can be showcased in many ways, but one way is to remind ourselves as to the epidemic of chronic diseases as one of the main challenge for humanity and, and one of the ways to, to, to highlight this issue is actually the economics that will uh, increasingly depend on an aging population which is plagued with various uh, forms of chronic degenerative diseases. And for these diseases, although medicine is evolving very rapidly, uh, we do have some limitations, even the most sophisticated ways to address uh, disease, chronic disease such as transplant will not be sufficient uh, going forward. And in that context, uh, at various levels, uh, including at federal levels, the regenerative medicine a promise is being uh, discussed increasingly as a very core discipline uh, as the field of medicine and surgery is going forward. Uh, if we um, see this interest, uh, it's really uh, remarkable to see uh, even more recently uh, how various structures uh, within the government and, and, and more generally uh, at the national uh, platform have increasingly addressed uh, this, uh, this domain. In fact, uh, a report that some of you may be interested to review has come up this year from the U.S. Senate focusing on innovations uh, for healthier Americans. And as part of this uh, uh, in comprehensive document, regenerative medicine has been highlighted, including uh, one aspect of regenerative medicine the one that uh, deals specifically with uh, stem cell therapy. And so it just gives you examples of how at the national level uh, this uh, field is increasingly uh, getting momentum uh, from, from various uh, uh, contributors. If we zoom in uh, uh, now on our experience at the Mayo Clinic, uh, first of all, Mayo Clinic um, has uh, uh, under the leadership of the Mayo Clinic Board of Governors he has embraced uh, regenerative medicine as a, a critical component of our overall activities and priorities and it's being deployed across the enterprise and what that means as Bernie already alluded to Mayo Clinic through all its centers including those in the Midwest Rochester being the headquarters but also in Arizona and Florida and we have representatives across the sites uh, have very dedicated uh, regenerative programs. Moreover, this enterprise uh, concept also means a multidisciplinary concept. So essentially all departments and all specialties are involved into the rollout of regenerative medicine. We have representations here from neurology, uh, ophthalmology, all the way to cardiology and uh, sports medicine, to name a few. And then also, although the focus is clearly on an aging population, we realize that regenerative medicine will be uh, very critical for lifelong conditions, uh, including, for example, congenital conditions, uh, in addition to the main focus on, on chronic uh, degenerative disease. Uh, furthermore, I think what has been uh, instrumental in guiding us how to, to build the regenerative medicine build-out is a focus on creating from the very beginning dedicated service lines. So the service lines are powered first of all by the advances in uh, the science uh, 
to the fundamental science. Many fields have contributed to our better understanding of the human body. In particular, the innate mechanisms of repair have been one of the main focus uh, that drives the regenerative fields. And on the other hand, the unmet needs uh, of the practice, and again, in a, in a very global way. And from a patient perspective, while we are deploying the service line across discovery, translation, application, from a, from a patient perspective, what they see is dedicated uh, access or portals, as we call them, where they can have access to regenerative medicine services, various infrastructures uh, that I will highlight in a second, and ultimately uh, how we we apply uh, these uh, specific uh, services uh, through, through different procedural activities. So if we zoom in on each of these elements, the patient will come uh, to Mayo and it typically has two ways of being seen, uh, either through self-referral and increasingly patients are interested uh, whether there is a solution in the regenerative space that pertains to their clinical condition and there we speak of education is a one domain that we can offer through our dedicated regenerative medicine consult service. But also this contact with the patient allows the patients to become ultimately its own solution as we have now infrastructures uh, where patients can deposit their biospecimens. And clearly in more traditional specialized consults we will offer to this patient primarily standard of care but when it's uh, feasible we will invite these patients to consider joining us uh, in, a, in a clinical trial as this uh, service is increasingly mature. Uh, furthermore, as I mentioned, beyond the initial contact with the patient, there are dedicated platforms that are being built. Uh, and here we have representation from all of the, the platforms. And in fact, I invite you to visit the Mayo Clinic booth where those are, are showcased even further. But specifically, the BioTrust will allow essentially a biobanking and initial processing facility and then as the technologies are evolving additional infrastructure with either focus on cellular therapies or biomaterials or ultimately what we, we call cell-free uh, regenerative regeneration and so this allows also an agnostic approach to the technology that ultimately drives regenerative solution obviously the stem cell component, which is showcased at this meeting, is, uh, is one of the, of the driver with the most, uh, most experience, at least clinical experience to date. What this looks like is, uh, is the starting point is the patient. The patient provides various biospecimens. These biospecimens are processed, but what is critical there is a clinical grade manufacturing and the quality release. So these are critical elements and then whether you use them for discovery purposes, translational purposes or ultimately application, they become available in a clinical grade form as a cell product, as a biomaterial or as a molecular or acellular regenerative product and then can be used back in terms of various clinical outputs uh, including clinical trials. And in fact, the clinical trial portfolio and in general a project portfolio in regenerative medicine at Mayo is pretty robust and again showcases the various fields of interest uh, from various disciplines as showcased here. So this is one of our guide how the field matures and how we are able to deploy increasingly regenerative medicine solutions. Uh, here are examples that many of you are using uh, is very prevalent in our sports medicine practice and through the presentation of Dr. Shapiro from Mayo Clinic Florida but also Jay Smith who is also joining us from Mayo Clinic Rochester you can get more information as to how these activities within sports medicine are being implemented and again leveraging other specialties and other experiences that ex exist at Mayo Clinic and the interplay let's say between transfusion medicine and sports medicine enables this type of technologies to be routinely used with patients. If we go further in more complex uh, conditions, let's say neurological conditions, Dr. Windebank will highlight some of them later, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or Lou Gehrig disease, 
Uh, he has been one of the focus. Lou Gehrig uh, himself uh, came to Mayo Clinic in 1939. This is actually the baseball that he um, gave as a gift to, to the physicians at, at the Mayo Clinic where his conditions was diagnosed. Uh, and today we are offering uh, different uh, maturity of clinical trials in this space. Again, the idea being to understand better the disease substrate, but also to uh, evolve uh, into uh, therapeutic options uh, for patients. And again, I will invite you to visit with Dr. Windebank, who uh, leads uh, these uh, clinical trial opportunities. And then a third example uh, really reflects something that you have seen uh, just uh, a while ago, presented by Dr. Lott from our Mayo Clinic uh, Arizona campus. Well, he focused there on the uh, regeneration of the trachea and larynx as a, as a critical domain uh, that we are developing. Uh, another example will be in valvular disease, where again, the interplay of regenerative medicine, in this case with imaging, bioengineering, other fields, allows you to, to develop very sophisticated uh, solutions. In, in that particular example, the interplay of cell therapy with, uh, with biomaterials based on, on 3D printing and furthermore, bioreactors to ensure uh, outcome. And as the field evolves, let's say, for valvular disease, it's no longer just a singular, let's say, a cell profile that needs to be generated, but there is an increased knowledge that allows uh, more complex tissues to be uh, truly bioprinted, as showcased in this, uh, in this animation. So, so the, as the field uh, is maturing, I think the other uh, critical domain that uh, that is very prevalent in our thinking is how to integrate uh, new therapeutic solutions within existing um, standards of care. And whether you use uh, the heart failure example um, as, as just a prototype, you could in principle apply it to, to other chronic diseases. So typically we deal in, in standard of care with the use of pharmacotherapy, in other words, drug therapy. Sometimes we have, as the disease evolves, access to devices uh, to uh, sustain uh, the patient, uh, allowing uh, life-extending uh, options, and ultimately a transplant. And as the, the field matures, it's very critical to start understanding where a regenerative intervention uh, can actually um, complement the standard of care. And, and many of the technologies that are used today, in many ways, uh, have as a common denominator this disease reversal goal, which is common and potentially may define even certain technology that are showcased here in this very slide as regenerative in nature, although maybe in a different way and in a different approach than the traditional use of a, of a biologic. But one critical opportunity that we have at the Mayo Clinic uh, is to have a very robust uh, uh, insight into what we have learned from the initial experiences. And this is an effort uh, led by Dr. Atta Bechwar and the cardiac regeneration team, where the opportunity is uh, essentially to define the limitations uh, that we have experienced. So let's say in the treating heart failure, one uh, maybe surprising observation uh, was that only rare are the patients that contain a truly reparative uh, stem cells in their bone marrow. And this may be due to various factors, in, including the disease itself, aging being maybe another contributor to a relatively limited patient population uh, apparently no more than 5% if you include uh, major analysis done at national level through the NHLBI and CCTRN networks. And what you see here is essentially a dichotomy of uh, responses. You have the, the responder, which is rare, uh, in which stem cells taken from the own bone marrow of that patient will lead to repair. And you have the non-responder, which is a majority, unfortunately, of patients, where you will not have necessarily repair. And now with uh, the molecular stringency of 
analysis, it is possible to uh, fully uh, decode the difference. What really makes a stem cell reparative versus a stem cell that is not reparative going at cellular level and ultimately, as you can see, at molecular level. So the whole field that we are developing is emerging, which we call essentially a clinomics way of ultimately optimizing cells. So at the very beginning, what we see is what I just mentioned, that uh, patients that contain reparative cells may be actually rare. These are those rare green individuals within the cohort. But the new technology allows us now to understand what are the fingerprints that defines a reparative phenotype versus a non-reparative phenotype. And then based on these uh, distinctions, we're now guided and informed to develop tools and processes and ultimately quality control for them uh, to ensure reparative performance and uh, ensure ultimately that a larger group of patients will be successfully treated. So from serendipity of stem cell therapy to a truly informed way of regeneration, that's really the main emphasis that I would like, the main take-home message I would like to leave with you. And it's in line with what you have heard this morning from the Food and Drug Administration, is how we can leverage not only preclinical and clinical trials, but also the true clinical experience uh, that we have as part of these uh, building blocks. And so in our case, what we focus on is to take a specific stem cell, and if you, if you look at the bottom, if you take it in an unguided uh, way, maybe that cell has a limited proficiency in repair. But uh, through one of the processes that we have learned, a cold lineage uh, uh, guidance, you are able to essentially convert this cell into a truly a reparative phenotype as a way to, to advance potentially the field. And so as part of this process, uh, then ultimately how you manufacture and release the cells becomes increasingly sophisticated. So you start from the starting material, but now you are including and optimizing steps, let's say step two, and ultimately you have to have a release algorithm to make sure that the optimizing step is really uh, achieved before you are able to release and use the product in the last step. So, so that's, we speak of a, of a multi-tier, essentially, process as this uh, field uh, evolved. And so this has been now implemented in, uh, in the next generation clinical trials uh, where uh, stem cells are no longer just uh, used from uh, the bone marrow of the patients and then uh, selected as, as a way to, to go after maybe the most uh, uh, potentially reparative subpopulation. But beyond this, uh, this uh, triaging of cells, there is, uh, uh, in the next step, a way to at least inculcate the first iteration of optimization, which, uh, as I mentioned, is called, in our case, lineage specification. And that's that new step, step three, which is at least the first step in that, in that regard. And so, in this case, stem cells are bombarded with specific cues which mimic developmental cardiogenic cues uh, as a way to ensure their cardioreparative proficiency. And the, once this uh, index uh, has been reached, then cells can be formally released uh, through a quality control process and ultimately uh, deliver to patients. And the delivery takes advantage of the evolution also of delivery uh, opportunities through, let's say, uh, interventional procedures and how you can marry now biology with uh, an interventional and clinical uh, way. So here, for example, you image where the lesion is and you are delivering, in this particular case, around the, the scar that followed the previous myocardial infarction. So we see evolution of the biotherapeutic, but we also see evolution of the delivery as we further understand and optimize the regenerative step while stratifying the, the patients. And this uh, trial is now 
after a phase two and phase three trials. It involves many countries in Europe. It will uh, soon also be deployed in the United States. So as a, as a blueprint, something that we have developed uh, with Arta Bechwar, I believe over a decade, um, is essentially summarized here, is, is the emphasis clearly on the discovery, with the understanding increasingly that discovery may not come just from preclinical or animal models or very fundamental science, but increasingly the source of information may be the patients that have gone uh, through, let's say, stem cell therapy uh, protocols, and then they become a unique uh, source of information. Then clearly uh, this discovery has to be uh, filtered through proof of concept and proof ultimately of efficacy uh, approaches uh, as we start to understand the translational uh, steps, but increasingly also to understand the manufacturing uh, steps are part of the standardization and scale up. And so healthcare providers are suddenly becoming not only discoverers and deliverers of therapies, but they are also part of this intermediate step, which is a supply chain step, which ultimately delivers a clinical grade a product that is ready for uh, clinical use. And we have different scorecards and different ways that we have developed with Mike Fenning and the administrative team that is here in tracking and some, although the paradigm is of science-driven practice advancement, some are more traditional from the academic uh, spectrum, publications for example, or clinical trials. Uh, volumes, but increasingly also how many of these uh, efforts had led to true uh, FDA interactions, INDs, and, and things of that nature. Similarly, on the clinical side, we're increasingly asking our clinical department uh, leaders to define the regenerative portfolios, and each here department has a role, and you can see some of the volumes that they have uh, defined under the regenerative space. Uh, clearly the educational element and also we have uh, a strong educa educational contingency with us uh, here as well. We are leveraging the five male schools uh, that exist to inculcate the specific curricula as a way to train our next generation, let's say medical scientists or graduate students and more broadly healthcare professionals through specific schools but also offering opportunities for non-male colleagues to also train in, let's say, a, a, an attractive program has been the Mayo Clinic Selective, where for one week from eight to five, this is the only thing you listen about is regenerative medicine and hopefully you become an expert within a week. But the main purpose really of this meeting is networking. This is just a partial list of some of the partners that Mayo Clinic has like to um, underscore our linkage with Karolinska University and uh, our colleagues uh, Carl Hendricks and others uh, internationally that are here. This interaction has been very, very useful uh, for us because it, it allows us to, in a very transparent way, uh, to share experiences but also drive the direction going forward. And the, the way we uh, sometimes see this type of of build-outs is while we start from the unmet need and ultimately we go to a specific solution, we see the role of the Center for Regenerative Medicine as a catalyst in bringing this new knowledge and then with other structures within the Mayo Clinic, let's say Mayo Ventures, building a true know-how, selecting the right partners and in each partner we look at specific functions here, for example, some of them are listed, such as the scale-up manufacturing capability, although increasingly we believe it can be done in-house or in uh, interactions with, uh, with the right partners. And this allow the build-out of opportunities that both from a financial but also from learning from the iterations that we do, what we have learned from, let's say, a specific clinical trial can then drive a new generation of knowledge to be built in this evergreen uh, iterative process. And so I will close with this slide uh, to emphasize that why, while today we're very much focused on the validity of regenerative medicine, 
validity, we mean safety, feasibility, efficacy, we are also very cognizant of ultimately the utility of regenerative medicine. And in that context, we are building awareness in other domains that will be able to enable a true regenerative medicine model of care. Thank you very much.